Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Stead, for asking me to speak on a very simple, easy topic that we'll cover quickly and with no problems at all. I know y'all gossip about me. <laughs> you seen that dude with a huge shiny head that hangs out at Trophy a lot? He's always sitting there reading and writing, sometimes all day long. Wears black t-shirts all the time. <laughs> Meeting with students and asking them disturbing questions that give them headaches, questions about reality why we have our senses, questions about art, transgenderism, theology. Yeah, I heard he teaches a weird assortment of courses. There's one like gothic horror. And then there's another one with like 60 people in it on Calvin and 16th century historical theology. Yeah, but dude, aren't those basically the same thing? <laughs> <clears throat> and I've heard the other rumors too, you know, that I get, you know, special treatment, a trophy. Right. But that's, that's not true. I spend my time reading and writing, and yeah, I'll drink a little bit of coffee and have an occasional donut or something like that. Um, none of these, thank you. It's <laughs> good. Now, Elisa, did you, the one shot and then the, yes. then the turbinado sugar in there, and then another shot, and then the milk and the little heart. Yeah, I got a little heart there. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that, yeah. Yeah. And uh, that's really good. That's good, okay, thank you. Y'all shouldn't gossip, it's not good. And Maddie, did you get the oil change done on my Highlander? Now, and I know I only gave you two days, but the 60 long papers from Calvin, are those done? Did you get those graded for me? Just put those in on the grade book. Um, and also, if my wife comes by, I ordered seltzer water and kale chips, all right? Don't wanna, don't wanna get in trouble at home. And can you put that on the math tab as usual, please? They're over there thinking about numbers like a bunch of Pythagorean Platonists. They don't know what's going on. <clears throat> so at this point, you have two questions. First of all, why are we doing two chapels on such a, such a strange subject as the transgender movement? And second of all, the more important question, where is Abner Chow? I only came to hear Dr. Chow. He was on the schedule. Uh, so I guess today I'm just going to have to identify as Dr. Chow. I will... Um, <clears throat> I want the power and the glory, but not the responsibility. Wouldn't mind the brains if I could get them. <laughs> Friday, Dr. Stead has arranged for Dr. Carl Truman, who's a professor at Grove City, previously taught at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, uh, is going to be coming in and speaking to us more or less on the subject of his book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. I read it when it came out. I immediately called all my friends and all my uh, uh, colleagues who are in senior leadership here and said, we need to get a copy of this to every faculty member and have them read it because this is the single best book on Christianity and theology and culture that I've read in 20 years. I think it's Francis Schaeffer level. It is not easy. It is long. It is difficult. It's essentially dealing with the meteoric rise of transgenderism in terms of intellectual history because it didn't come out of nowhere. So it's in terms of intellectual history, so do not miss chapel on Friday. Dr. Truman is going to be really, really good. Uh, plus, he's British, so he has a cool accent. <clears throat> history, of course, is that thing that leads up to right now. Now, you may feel that the world has gone completely crazy. For instance, in libraries all over the world, George Orwell's dystopian novel 1984 has recently been moved to the nonfiction section. You may think that the world has suddenly lost its mind. No. You are simply witnessing the rapid unfurling of a tightly wound package of human lunacy, psychosis, pathology, confusion, and at the root, 
rebellion against God, in whose image we are made, and whose image in us we, in our fallen natures, hate and wish to eradicate, to efface, to erase, and to obliterate, because it is a continual reminder of what we have lost. Humanity, corporately, and humans individually, is and are not now, suddenly and never, will be changing our nature, altering our identity, or beginning to inhabit our authentic self after some sort of transition from a previous false existence. The supposedly materialist basis of modern thought, post-Baconian scientific worldview, Darwinian theories of origins, Marxian scientific supposedly descriptions of history and economic relations, and Freudian concepts of the self, in that modern view of the world, the material is the prime reality. That's what's really real. And therefore, as a result of the fact that the modernist worldview is a materialist worldview, the transgender community has a tremendous philosophical and linguistic problem with the idea of a biological male claiming status as a female, even if he swims really, really fast. Your XX or XY chromosome set is built into every cell of your body. There is a full blueprint of your sex advertised like a billboard at the molecular level in every cubic centimeter of your body. Even as your male tongue says you are a woman, the bits of matter of which your tongue is constituted proclaim your confusion. To say that your sense of self, your gender identity, as it is popularly called, is in fact detached from your material chromosomal set and the body that it has blueprinted, designed, and built, so that your body is now uh, female but your consciousness is male, is that that is somehow a mistake, and that this mistake has occurred in the relationship between your biological structure and your conscious identity is in fact an anti-materialist position denies material, biological, visible reality. It's actually much more like a religious statement. It is a sense, it's a feeling. I'm not denying the feelings are real, but it is a feeling, it is a sense. It is perhaps, in many cases, even sensed as a kind of hope. I hope I can get a body that matches my consciousness. It is, I would say, even an act of faith. It is a belief. And so some of the deepest questions of philosophy, the relationship between being and thinking, the relationship between ontology and epistemology, the relationship between certainty and doubt, the Cartesian mind-body duality built around the phrase cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am, and what neurobiologist calls the qualia of the hard problem of the material biological basis of consciousness. How can stuff know that it is? How come that speaker is made out of material and I'm made out of material, but I know what I am, but the speaker doesn't? All of those philosophical questions are being primarily handled today by 16-year-olds with TikTok accounts. <laughs> this is not to say, this is not to say that the intellectual leaders, particularly in the universities, are uninvolved. In many ways, they have laid the intellectual groundwork through the 1960s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, particularly for the movement, which has grown explosively due to the accelerant of social media. You understand that the number of hits that transgenderism and various similar kinds of uh, videos and posts on social media hit is running into the billions, the billions, which means hundreds of millions, billions of people are watching these things over and over and over again and are being programmed. Why do you think they call it a computer program? Why do you think television has programs? Why is there so much human interest in what? We are male, female, old, young, Republican, Democrat, short, tall. It's because the greatest question is the ancient question, often formulated as quid est homo or what is man? What is man? What are we? What am I?
Where do I aim this? Is this like a laser? Can I get people in the audience with it? Turn it on. There we go. Oh, little buzzing sound. Always follow the instructions when all else fails. I want to talk to you today about what I call the metamorphic identity industrial complex. There's no need to have such a fancy term. It's just that I have a lot of advanced degrees and I need to sound smart. <laughs> Here's what I want to start with. This is actually a line from Philip Reap, who's a very, very interesting thinker. Not a believer, by the way. He says that the new idolatry is the conception that we can change our identity, right? Identity change constitutes the new idolatry. This is a secular, very brilliant, but very secular thinker. So here we go. First the bomb, then the shrapnel. The concept of an identity, whether you think you can change your identity, including your gender identity, or not, the concept of identity is a false construct. It is not biblical. It is a secular, psychologized, and imaginary concept. It isn't real. In the modernist psychological structure, identity uh, is something that is the location and the content of who and what you are, or at least what you perceive yourself to be. But intellectual historians who've studied this idea point out that there are no ancient texts, philosophical, literary, or otherwise, that in any clear way talk about the idea of identity or even individual identity. It's actually usually attributed as an invention of the Renaissance, the period that I specialize in studying. As a matter of fact, one of the leading Renaissance scholars in the last 30 years, Stephen Greenblatt, who taught at Berkeley for years and is now at Harvard, um, uh, his first book was called Renaissance Self-Fashioning. He's, he's one of the people that pointed out that, that writers in the Renaissance, people in the Renaissance, were the first people that thought of themselves as individuals. Doesn't mean that there weren't individuals in the past. It means they're the first people to think of themselves as individuous, which is a Latin word which means that which cannot be divided, and began to construct an identity through their social interactions and self-imagination. There is nothing in the ancient literature or philosophy or even theology along the lines of the modern concept of what we now think of as personal individual identity. Yeah, in people like Augustine, you will see references to self-awareness. But the pagan Romans, for example, talked of their persona, where we get the word person and personality, but the Latin word persona means a mask. Their persona was what they presented to other people. In other words, identity for the Romans, even now with most critical theorists, is something that is performative. It's a thing you do, not a thing that you are. So in the modern world, we think of identity as a place sometimes. My identity is right here. My identity is inside of me. We locate it. It's a location. It's topographical. We think of it sometimes as a container. My identity contains all that I am. We sometimes uh, think of identity in terms of this uh, highly commodified, self-centered, 21st central cultural icons, of images of everything as a commodity, a thing that you can buy and sell, a thing you can own, a thing that you don't have that you wish you did have. That's how we often think of an identity. We think of identity like we think of the things, the things that we desire. We think of identity as a thing that we desire, a thing that perhaps we have purchased, a thing that we own or possess. I have my own identity. You've got your identity. I've got my identity. We think of it sometimes like a bag containing stuff or a box or a wallet or a handbag or a storage unit containing who and what we are, all the elements of who and what we are, where our identity is stored or kept. It's a possession. It's a thing. It's like an object. We think of it often like a purchased product, and we think we can go to the exchange desk at the Walmart and exchange it and switch it out for another one, a newer product, one that will please us more. But you do not have an identity in those modernist, secularist, psychologized terms. You do not have an identity in the sort of terms I just described, I just used to describe this widely held belief. 
you do not. Now please note, I did not say you do not exist. I said that your concept of possessing a thing that is an identity and perhaps therefore a you that you can change or exchange for another different you is an unexamined psychological linguistic construct that you have been taught by your culture. It is not that there is no you. Of course there's a you. It is that you are confused about the nature of your you-ness. In other words, as Jeremiah 17, 9 tells us, you do not and cannot know yourself. Rather than possessing a thing called an identity, you are the image bearer of God. You are under his continual sovereign providential disposition, under his rule and under his care. You are in fact a mirror. You are a reflection, a copy of God's attributes without yourself actually being or ever becoming God. Your function is to reflect like a mirror his glory back to him. Not to be an entity unto yourself, an individual in the modern secular sense. To have your own identity. What does Jesus say? He who finds his life, finds himself, we might say, loses it. He who loses it, finds it. Human image bearers are perhaps best understood of consisting of two elements. And I know theologians love to split hairs and argue about tripartite and bipartite. Blah, blah, blah. That's, that's not particularly important, actually. That's why they argue about it. The harder people argue, the less important the point. You have a body, and your body never changes its essential nature. It changes its form, right? You're born, you grow up, you go through, you know, certain kind of physical maturing, and then eventually your body degrades. All of this is, of course, due to sin. This is the material element of you, but it is not your identity. Your body is not your you, or it is not the only part of you. If your body was your identity, your you, then you would cease to exist at death. Your mind, your consciousness, your soul, right? Mind is the popular term, consciousness, a little bit more scientific, soul, theological term. The, your consciousness, your self-awareness is in fact malleable in a way that your body is not. Your soul, your mind, your consciousness is changeable both before and after conversion. The conscious, non-material self undergoes various changes maturing and then declining towards death, just like the body. And the greatest change is the ontological reversal at the core of your being, which is known as conversion. And conversion, by the way, is not changing your mind and being convinced by new information that you intellectually assent to. It is not a reorganization of the structure of your values. It's not believing something you didn't believe before. It is a radical new recreation. You become a new creature. by an act of God. And after conversion, many changes occur as part of the sanctification process. But notice, the new creature is spiritual and immaterial consciousness. You do not get a new or changed body at conversion. That comes at glorification. If you wish to think of yourself as having an identity, a you that you somehow possess, like an object, like a body, then that identity is only and entirely grounded in being the imago dei, the image of God, and specifically in your identity in Christ, your all in all. Do you ever notice how strange it is when Paul says, not I, but Christ dwells in me? We tend to focus on the last part of that clause, but what about the first part? Not I. How can you not dwell in yourself? The Bible says you as a self do not dwell in yourself. As a believer, Christ dwells in you. Does that make sense? Not to the fallen mind, no. The feeling of being transgendered is ultimately a desire for an object. This is one of the places where Freud, by the way, happens to be right. Human beings are knots of desires that function primarily through discontent, right? What scripture calls unthankfulness. When you're unthankful, you forget God, and when you forget God, you are unthankful, and you find yourself tied up in a ball, a knot of discontent. I want, I want, I want, I don't have, don't have, don't have. Human beings are desires that largely go unfulfilled. 
So the feeling of being transgendered, of not being comfortable in your body, which is real, it happens, it happens to a lot of people, is a desire for an object, a differentiated body from the one that you have now. Your current body is viewed by your conscious mind as an error. I'm trapped in the wrong body. This is how Carl Truman starts off his excellent book. He says, I began to wonder how do we get to the point where a man can say, I'm a man, but I'm actually a woman trapped in a man's body. And everyone says, oh yeah, right, of course. To say that you were trapped in the wrong body and your desire is for a new exterior and physical body and that will be the cure for your emotional and mental anguish. And it's real anguish. It is an idealized object of desire, this new body, that you believe will finally map accurately onto the conscious identity which is perceived by the self as the self because we believe we have identities, but we don't. So you think when you get the new body or you're transitioning to the new body that the problem is solved and you say, I feel at home now. But this is what all the theorists properly recognize as performance. You are taught to act like a little boy, like a little girl. You were taught to act like a doctor. You were taught to act like, like, uh, uh, like a teacher. You were taught to act like a fireman. You were taught to act like a gentleman. This is performativity. But remember, the driving force in all human beings, fallen or fallen but redeemed, is always desire. And desire is always for something that's understood as an object. You, you can have no desire for a particular object. Would you like some more blueberry pie? Oh no, I'm full, sweetie, that was really good. I have no desire for a particular object, but I can't have a desire for nothing. I can't say, I desire a nothing. I can say I desire nothing, but I can't say I desire a nothing. You understand the distinction? Always make distinctions. This widespread conception of possessing an identity, a thing that can be changed or exchanged at will, has rapidly expanded in recent years due to what I call the metamorphic identity industrial complex. The mass media, especially visual forms, as well as politics, business, entertainment, and culture generally, have unleashed a tidal wave of pressure regarding this idea of transgenderism. It is perfectly acceptable, preferable even, in the modern world, to use social media to, uh, to post about, uh, 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 about uh, your transition from male to female, but you will be blocked if you detransition. They're blocking all the detransitioners on the social media. Apparently, transition is only a one-way street. Your social and business life will be canceled. You will be doxxed. You will be called a hater and a bigot and a transphobe and a lot of other names if you oppose giving puberty blockers to children or if you speak out against teaching gender fluidity to third graders in public school. And it is a complex, a system, because it has many, many parts working as a system, and it's working very, very effectively. It is industrial, metaphorically, because it works like a factory, efficiently building minds that are programmed to uncritically accept every possible thing presented as true because someone claims that their feelings are their truth and must be received with submission. And I also call it metamorphic identity, the metamorphic identity industrial complex, barring, I think it was Truman's phrase, right, about the military industrial complex in, in the 50s and afterwards. I call it metamorphic identity because the central trope, the main figure of speech, the presented truth, is that you can change, metamorphose your identity, specifically your maleness or female, to its opposite or even to something else non-binary or gender queer. This is why, this is why the fashionable, trendy movement of changing your identity like you change your house or your pants or your hair color is ultimately idolatry. It is a form of false worship. Now, I am not denying, nor would I want to have no care, kindness, charity, or pity for people who suffer the anguish of having these feelings because I believe that that does happen. I believe it's real. But if we begin to press back a little bit on the question of identity, for instance, if you go to psychology today, which ought to be the authority on this, and you look up identity, self-image, self-concept, reviewed by Psychology Today staff, identity encompasses the memories, experiences, relationships, and values that create one's sense of self. You are functionally the sum of all your memories. If all your memories were wiped away, would you actually fully be you? You are the sum of all of your history up to this point, right? 
This amalgamation, putting together, creates a steady sense of who one is over time, even as new facets are developed and incorporated into one's identity. Okay, I mean, that, that, that sounds reasonable, right? But then you look at the subtabs. What is identity, which is where we are here? And number two, how to be authentic. And then the theories, plural, theories of identity. In other words, that's like saying, we don't know. We don't know what I did. There are all kinds of theories, but we don't know. You, it, it, it's not like chemistry. You can't put it in test tubes and titrate it and figure out what it is. Oh, there's a lot of sodium in that one. There are theories of identity, but they don't know what identity is, and they're proclaiming it here on Psychology Today. And how about how to be authentic? What does that mean? If you're being authentic and real with people, then you're being yourself, right? But what if you're a lying, manipulating cheater? Then you are being yourself your authentic self, which is a false self. And the reason that we're seeing this happen so quickly is that social media has functioned primarily as an accelerant. It's like pouring gasoline on a fire that's already burning. Listen to this, okay? This is from Newsweek, quite recently, about a week or two ago. 30%, 30% of millennials 30% identify as LGBTQ, according to a soon-to-be-released study that is based on scientific polling data. Among Christians, the numbers were lower, but only slightly, with just under 30% of millennial Christians identifying as LGBTQ. The portion of the population that describes itself as gay has varied over the years from 10%, based on research by Alfred Kinsey and widely promoted by the National Gay Task Force in 1977, to less than 6% in a recent Gallup poll. The pollster who worked on the news study, George Barna, attributes the unusually high number he found to social and news media coverage that makes it safe and cool for young Americans to identify as LGBTQ, whether or not it represents their actual sexual orientation. That itself is performative. I don't actually, as a boy, like boys, but since that's the cool thing, I want to be that. And it will help me be accepted. Barna says it's a subset of a larger issue that this is a generation where three out of four are searching for meaning. Of course they are. Everyone's doing that. This is a group that doesn't have a reason to get out of bed in the morning. Therefore, the LGBTQ identity gives them comfort. A lot of this generation claim to be moving in that direction, but there's a big difference between claiming the identity and living the lifestyle. But why would you claim the identity and not live the lifestyle? Is that authentic? That's the problem. You guys have heard about the swimmer, right? Now, this was on, this photograph on the left was on NBC Today Show. And somebody tweeted out, whatever that tweetery thing is that people do, right? The photograph that showed up, and it's on the right on NBC Today, when they were talking about Leah Thomas, who is a male in a woman's swimsuit winning Division I NCAA National Swimming Championships. Why? Because he's a gigantic, really strong dude. And he's swimming against females. All right, and then the person who saw this photograph thought, wow, that, you know, that looks like someone's Instagram filtered photo right there. And they found the original photograph on the sports photojournalist's website. And on the left is the original photograph. So you're telling me that when a man comes up out of the water after swimming the 500 meters, that he has beads of water on his face, but a woman doesn't? They're airbrushed away. Are you telling me that the softened lip, the smooth mouth, the nice threaded eyebrows, and the fact that the man has little uh, uh, goggle scars around his eye, but the woman doesn't? Really? Is that, what are they trying to do here? I'll tell you what they're trying to do there. They're using the metamorphic identity industrial complex to convince you that a man can be a beautiful woman. They're trying to turn him into a Vermeer painting. They've airbrushed away aspects that they thought were too harsh and have softened him up with photographic filtering in order to make him appear more feminine. That's what they're doing. Now, I remember as a kid, I didn't like Wheaties, but I thought Bruce Jenner was awesome. So I started to have my mom buy Wheaties. And I crammed, I, I still think that they're awful tasting little wheat flakes, but <laughs> we started buying Wheaties. And I remember thinking, what? I mean, this was, this, was, this was the epitome of masculinity for a guy that was 13 or 14 years old. I wanted to look like him. I never did, never will at this point, right? <laughs> but he did not want to look like him. 
he wanted instead to look like her. Now this is a weird cultural moment because I really had to struggle with, do I show the entire cover of Vanity Fair magazine in chapel? <laughs> Even though it's a dude in a fairly skimpy woman's swimsuit that has been through surgery and has clearly been retouched, it was, weirdly enough, just a little too racy. Do you understand the cultural moment in which you live? The most appropriately named magazine of all time, by the way. If you've seen any movies made in the last 20 years, you've seen Ellen Page. I think she's a really good actress. I think she's very talented. I think she's very smart. She's very, very watchable. You may have seen her in Inception, right, where she plays the character of Ariadne. You've got two minutes to make a maze, draw a maze that takes one minute to solve. Right? And uh, so she plays this character in Inception, and her job is to design maze like dream worlds that people through a special machine go into and inhabit. Right? <clears throat> At one point, she actually walks up to a mirror in part of the dream world that has been constructed for her to enter mentally while she's asleep, and she touches a piece of glass that is a mirror in a Paris street, and the glass breaks. So she simultaneously becomes like Alice going through the looking glass, and the classical figure of Narcissus who sees his own image in a pond and then falls in love with himself. But she is also, since her character's name is Ariadne, she's the classical mythological figure of Ariadne who gives Theseus the thread to help him find his way into and out of the labyrinth in order to meet and kill the minotaur and get back out of the labyrinth. Mirrors, labyrinths, threads. Now Ellen Page is Elliot Page. Shows up on the, she'd never made the cover of Time magazine before, but when she became a man, the story was, I am fully who I am. You understand how weighted the phrase I am is. It's a statement of being. It's an ontological statement. I am fully who I am. And here is Elliot Page now doing a kind of a discount Justin Bieber, right? She's turned into a man. If you've seen the film Inception, you understand that the central trope, the central metaphor is the labyrinth, right? The myth of the minotaur, this half man, half you know, bull monster that lives in the center of this gigantic maze and you can never find your way in or out. And if you do find your way to the middle, the minotaur is there and he will eat you, he will devour you, right? And Theseus comes on a boat, he's gonna be one of the Athenian kids to be sacrificed to the minotaur in this horrible regularized ritual. But he decides, I'm not gonna be sacrificed, I'm bringing a sword, I'm gonna go into the I'm going to go into the labyrinth and I'm going to kill the Minotaur and save the Athenian kids who are being sacrificed to him. And as soon as he gets off the boat, Ariadne's there on the dock. She's like, oh, he's so hot right now. And so she says, here, take some of my yarn and tie it to the doorpost and work your way in and that will help you find your way back out after you kill the Minotaur. And this is a central myth that John Calvin appropriates and uses as a core metaphor all the way the, through the first three books of the Institutes of the Christian Religion. First edition he did when he was 65 or 25. What are you going to do with your life? What are you going to do? Are you going to write the Institutes before you're 25? What are you going to do? Spend all your time on TikTok? Spend too, spend, spend too much time at the, the cafe? Actually, forget that. Erase that part. <laughs> right? Calvin who was the leading classicist in France in the 16th century, uses that metaphor and he says, human beings are like a labyrinth. The only way you can know God is to know yourself. The only way you can know yourself is to know God. That's the opening line of the Institutes. Book one, chapter one, subsection one, paragraph one, line one. The only way to know God is to know yourself. The only way to know yourself and know God I, I, the only way to know yourself is to know God. The only way to know God is to know yourself. And, and that seems to make no sense at all. How can you do either one of those things? You have to do both of them at the same time. Why? Because you are the Imago Dei. You are the image of God, broken as you are. You are like a labyrinth. You're a mirror that is like a labyrinth. You can't find your way down into the depths of who you are and you wouldn't want to meet the minotaur at the bottom of your existence. And if you did go to the bottom of who you really are, your identity, you'd never find your way out. 
Why are you like a labyrinth? Why are you a mirror that's like a labyrinth? Because as a mirror, your design is to reflect the goodness and the glory and the beauty and the holiness of God, who is himself a labyrinth. You think that you can plumb the depths of God? He is amazed. That will leave you amazed. You cannot find your way into the depths of God. And if you did, you would never find your way back out. And that's the central metaphor of Christopher Nolan's movie, right? Maybe the most famous myth of them all, as we see in Caravaggio's late 16th century painting of Narcissus, is from Ovid. Ovid's Metamorphoses is the single most influential book in Western literature. More, more, uh, uh, more powerful than Homer, had more influence on uh, minor writers like Shakespeare. Everyone after Ovid in the first century in the reign of Caesar Augustus, everyone read Ovid, everyone is heavily influenced by Ovid, who has a retelling of a collection of all the great Greco-Roman myths. And Ovid puts the malleability, the changeableness, because the metamorphosis is all about change. That's the central metaphor. Every character goes through some kind of change. That's what links all the stories together. Ovid puts the malleability, the change, in the body. The opening line, he says, animus fert in novar corporis. I sing of bodies changed. He's the ultimate billboard for transgenderism. 2,000 years ago. Every story is about change. Daphne is being chased by Apollo. She turns into a, uh, t- turns into a, into a laurel tree. She doesn't want to date with Apollo. Pan is chasing Searing. She cries out to the naiads, change me, change me. She turn, turns into a clump of reeds. She doesn't want to go on a date with Pan. Narcissus eventually turns into a flower, but he turns into a flower because he sees his own reflection, falls in love with himself, falls in love with his twin, with his reflection, falls in love with himself, and out of exhaustion, drowns in the water and dies. Even the Greek pagans understood that self-love is destructive. But the odd thing about Narcissus is he falls in love with himself and he's a dude. This is a metaphorical picture of homosexuality, the sexual attraction to one who is the same as you. Instead of being attracted to the one who is your opposite, you're attracted to the one who mirrors you. The most interesting thing about this painting is that Caravaggio was himself, of course, homosexual. And he paints himself into most of his paintings. This is, in fact, a self-portrait. One of my favorite moments when I take students to Florence, when you go into the Uffizi Gallery, and I have them line up by Caravaggio's fabulous head of Medusa painted on a shield. So it's a kind of a round, three-dimensional round shield. And it's the story of Medusa, and I have all of them, you know, do uh, uh, the face where it looks like Medusa's head, right? They all try and imitate it, but none of them are good at that. So I say, so just imagine that you're trying to take a bowling exam, and they're like, (gasps) right? Okay. And when you get close up to this horrifying image, it's really startling, right? What you get is a reminder of the great myth of Perseus and Medusa. Medusa is one of the Gorgon sisters. She's so ugly that Her power is that if you see her, you are turned to stone. Perseus knows he can't walk up to her and kill her, so he polishes his bronze shield, gets the shield at such an angle that he can see her reflection, right? And then when she sees her reflection, she sees, oh, I'm really having a very bad hair day, snake hair day, in fact, and she's turned to stone. And this is the moment where Medusa sees herself in the mirror shield and is so horrified by her horrifyingness that she turns to stone, Perseus, wax off her head. But again, this face is Caravaggio's face. Talk about convicting yourself with your own painting. Caravaggio looks upon the mirror of his own homosexual identity and paints himself as a female who is beheaded by a male. What has often been called the first great modern myth. Have you ever noticed the power of myth? That's why I teach teach classics, right? The power of myth and what scholars have called the first great modern myth, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, one of the greatest novels of all time, by the way, written by an 18-year-old woman. First novel, 18 years old. What are you going to do with your life? (laughs) 
Notice how powerful these explanatory stories are. And this is not the flat top universal 1930 Frankenstein with Boris Karloff going, Arr. it's not that Frankenstein. This is a philosophical story, right? The Frankenstein creature starts off mute, but then he becomes as powerful an orator as Cicero. And what does he read? The classics. Victor, he's not Dr. Frankenstein, he's actually the ultimate biology undergraduate. He does a science project, and he makes a human from chopped up corpse bits, and then he animates and brings his creature to life. And at one very powerful point, the creature who does not know who or what he is, which means he's very human, sees his reflection in a pond, just like Narcissus and is horrified to discover his horrifyingness and begins to hate himself. And his hatred takes the form of the hatred of Victor, his creator, his father who made him. And the rest of the novel is about how the creature is going to track down Victor and kill him, but not before he kills as many of Victor's friends and family members, including a young child, as he can. The creature at one point corners Victor and says, I'm lonely, I'm miserable, make me a chick. He wants a woman. Victor starts off on this second science project and bails. He decides, no, 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 I'm not gonna make a woman because the two of you will get together and reproduce and make an army of monsters. Notice in the very first edition here, there's an epigraph from Paradise Lost. I put it up here. This is where Adam, after he has fallen, is arguing with God. And Adam, in Milton's Paradise Lost, says to God, did I request thee, maker, from my clay to mold me, man? Did I ask you to make me? Did, did I solicit thee from darkness to provide? Why did you make me? Why did you make me thus? Why did you make me as I am? All right? This is, this is the same thing. It's over and over and over again. Now, if Mary Shelley wrote this novel today, it would be very quickly optioned as a Disney superhero film with a lot of catchy tunes, where Victor Frankenstein would create a man out of a dead body, uh, uh, about a bunch of different dead body parts, and then when he realized the creature was depressed, instead of making him a lady creature or trying to kill him, he would just put him on hormone blockers and buy him a dress and high heels. Actually, I think I just described a Rocky Horror Picture Show, didn't I? How about what is often considered the greatest literary text of all time. The most brilliant of all literary characters, Hamlet in Act Two, Scene Two, as he's asking the question, what is man? What a piece of work is a man. How noble in reason, how infinite in faculty, in form, in moving, how express and admirable, in action, how like an angel, in apprehension, how like a god. The beauty of the world, that's what you were made to be. The most beautiful thing in God's creation. But look at you. the paragon of animals, the highest of everything God made. And yet to me, what is this quintessence of dust, right? The primary piece of human thought about humanity always ends up with some form of self-loathing. It often takes the form of narcissism. Which brings us to the text. That's a long introduction, but I don't need to comment on Romans 1. I'm just gonna read it for you and think about it in terms of what I have been saying. Romans 1, starting at verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold or suppress or repress or deny or lie or try to hold back the truth in unrighteousness. Human beings are primarily engaged in suppressing the truth. What truth? Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath shown it unto them. Everyone knows what they are. They just don't like it because they don't like their maker. For the invisible things of him, of God, from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Do you ever notice how strange the Bible is? How can invisible things be clearly seen? I thought invisible meant you couldn't see it. The invisible things of him are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, that's us, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. 
Because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. That's the discontent, the unthankfulness, the I'm not happy with how I was formed. But became vain in their imagination, and their foolish heart was darkened. And I would put right there the human modernist invention of the idea of an identity. It's vain in both senses of the word. It's futile, and it's vainglorious. It's arrogant. And it happens in our imagination. And our hearts become foolish and darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Change the glory of the incorruptible God to an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up. And you know what happens in the rest up to 32. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I don't need to do that. You should read it again, though. And again and again and again, right? What you are seeing is the result of God giving people up. When they are utterly determined to attempt to erase, efface, and obliterate the image of God in them. Because he says at the beginning, he created them male and female. He said it was very good. What could be more wonderful than the creation of woman? What is more fabulous than woman? What is more glorious than man? What is more beautiful than mankind, humanity, in all of our, yes, individuality, and our beautiful variety? See, the problem with reality is it is that thing which when you stop believing in it doesn't go away. And what I think we can say is that people who are struggling with the very real feelings of transgenderism have actually embraced what the ancient Greeks called oikophobia. It is a hatred or a dislike of your own home. I don't like what I am. I don't like my body. It's just a modernized version of not liking the fact that you're American or Romanian or French or white or black or short or tall or male or female. Now what I want to do is I want to repeat this phrase for you. The image of God, imago Dei, right? We are originally created with incalculable glory. People think that Calvin always talks about total depravity. He does, but he talks about the total glory of man as originally designed by God. And then man spends all of his time trying to understand himself, like in Leonardo's famous drawing. But we end up having photos of ourselves looking cute at the entrance to Auschwitz. The image of God. The image of God. The image of God. This woman, man, refers to herself, himself, as a transgender Satanist, the image of God. No matter how hard you try to erase it, it cannot be effaced. The image of God. This mother is the image of God. This little child is the image of God. This male drag queen doing drag queen story hour at a public library is still the image of God. Broken, twisted, bent, a shattered mirror. Still the image of God. This man, this man, this man, still the image of God. Right? This is why Paul says, as you get to the end of Romans 1, he says, they not only do such things, but they glory in them. They post the photos. Look at me. I have a new identity. Little girl to a little boy. The image of God in every single case. Every single case. The image of God. The mother says, I knew the hormones wouldn't work. Why did they play with her life? The bereaved mom blames L.A. County. This is last week. Blames L.A. County for her teenage daughter's suicide, claiming the school pushed her to transition to a male instead of properly treating her depression. Every one of them, the image of God. Did you know that trans people suffer mental health issues by self-reporting? and attempt and succeed at suicide at the exact same rate before and during and after any form of transition. It's a cure that doesn't work. Look, some of you 
suffer from feelings like this, senses like this, beliefs like this. Some of you deal with all kinds of same-sex attraction. Some of you struggle with heterosexual lust. All of us tend to be liars, manipulators, arrogant. All of us are sinners. We're made in the image of God, but we're all fallen and broken. How, how do you deal with all of this? Do you understand the irony of this? Trans people will not be erased. They're the ones trying to erase themselves. But it's not the self. It's the attempt to erase the image of God in them as designed and created. So how do you deal with this? I call this the mythopoetics of swarm think. Everyone is thinking the same because everyone's absorbing it through the media. They think that if we tell ourselves the stories often enough that we will poetically, we will, and this is what Truman talks about, the poesis, the idea that I can create and recreate myself, but you cannot. All you can do is be recreated as a new creature in Christ. That's how it works. That's how it's always worked. That's the only way that it will work. So how do you treat people who suffer with these things? With love, with kindness, with charity, but with the truth. The only identity you have, the only identity you can ever have is as a bearer of the image of God. And the intense desire for a new you can only be fulfilled through the new you that comes at conversion.